the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. So Mark has had us uh, squeamish a bit for the last several weeks, and it only seems to get harder week in and week out. Uh, but I think it's because Jesus knows what challenges us. And Jesus came in the human form to help us through these challenges. And today he tackles wealth. And as one of the wealthiest counties in the wealthiest nation the world has ever known, we should be paying particular attention. And I'm sure the part about the camel through the eye of a needle left us looking for a way out. What was Jesus saying? Well, first, the story. Jesus is on his way somewhere, as he often is, uh, and, and a wealthy man comes up to him and, and tries a little bit of flattery. Good teacher. Then he bows down a little of deference to Jesus and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus turns to him and says, first, and he knows where this man's vulnerability is. He knows where this man's fault is. And he says, you call me good. Why do you call me good? Only God is good. And I am only capable of what I do because God fills me with God's word. It is God who's good. It is God who's rich. It is God who has power. He's changing the paradigm for this rich man. And then he tells the rich man, do you follow the commandments and list the commandments? And uh, uh, the man's kept his nose clean. And his hands clean. And he says, absolutely, I've followed them all since my youth. And this is the part that I think is worth paying attention to. Jesus loved him. Jesus looks at him in the eye. Jesus looks at him. And Jesus loved him. And Jesus says, there's just one more thing. You must go and sell all your possessions and give them to the poor. Just a little thing. And the man, all of a sudden, slumps over and looks heartbroken as he walks away. Now, my hope is that the story doesn't end. We don't know what happens, but my hope is that he gets home and he realizes uh, that everything that he has isn't worth what he thinks it is, and that there's something greater, uh, and that there's more to the story. But that's where the story ends. Uh, and then Jesus is talking to his disciples, as he has for the last several weeks afterwards, uh, debriefing, and they're kind of challenging him. They're like, uh, Jesus, what were you saying about wealth? And he says, it's harder for a wealthy man to enter the kingdom of heaven than it is for a camel to squeeze through the eye of the needle. We've tried to make this a little bit more palatable over the, uh, over the years. For a, a long time, there was this theory, this theory that there was actually a gate to Jerusalem called uh, the Camel's Eye. And it was a gate that when you closed it, uh, people could still walk through, but an army wouldn't be able to get through. So it was, uh, when it was closed, it was narrow enough uh, that you could squeeze through, uh, but you couldn't have uh, a, a whole army slide through. So a camel could fit through if it took off all of the bags uh, and the saddle uh, and then uh, humbled itself to kind of bow down and, and, and wedge through. Uh, and I think there's a good message there that, uh, that is not necessarily about our wealth, uh, but about learning uh, how much we need versus how much we want uh, and taking off all of that excess. That's a good message, but I don't think that was Jesus' message. And historians have started to question the validity uh, of, of that interpretation. They do believe that Jesus meant what he said. It is harder for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven than for a camel to fit through the eye of a tiny needle. An impossibility. I think that's true. But I also think heaven is filled with plenty of people who enjoyed worldly wealth. But they didn't get to heaven because of their own doing. Money wields a tremendous amount of influence. Money makes you look more attractive to other people. Money allows you security. Money gives you power to influence leaders, friends. Money does a lot of things. But money doesn't get you an inch closer to heaven. Only God. In fact, Jesus is warning that money might be the kind of thing that, that you hold on so tightly that you miss the door, that you miss an opportunity to be a follower of Christ, just like this man. There's a, uh, 
there's a story about a, a Viking king, a Viking king who, uh, who accepted Christianity, became a Christian. So uh, as kings are inclined to do, he said, well, if I'm going to be a Christian, everyone's going to be a Christian. So he ordered all the Vikings to be baptized. I said this phenomena happened as they watched uh, and they saw all of the Vikings head into the water uh, and they noticed that all of the men walked in with their hands above the water, with their, uh, with their dominant hand above water. Uh, and it turns out that they had heard that all things that get wet belong to God. And they only needed to keep their hands so that they could fight, so they could wield their sword. God wants our lives fully immersed. God is in the business of transformation. Jesus looks at that man and loves him. And while Jesus is certainly in solidarity with the poor, he doesn't want him to get rid of everything uh, so that the poor have food to eat, although he does, cons that he does consider that. He wants this man to enjoy the life that he has in front of him, but he's not seizing. He wants this man to be immersed in the love and grace of God. And he sees that he's holding on so tightly to his money that he's missing it. Almost a year ago, and we're celebrating this week uh, the National Association of Episcopal Schools, Episcopal Schools Week. Uh, and almost a year ago, we were out in, in California for the, for the biennial conference, uh, and we heard from this woman, Madeline Levine, uh, who's lived in some of the most prominent neighborhoods in America, uh, in the heart of New York City and Marin County, uh, California. Uh, and she talks about an epidemic that, as a psychologist, she's experienced that younger and younger children of incredibly wealthy uh, uh, families are coming into her office. And she described uh, this child who is hardly more than Elliot's age, uh, 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 barely a teenager, coming in uh, and just being so riddled with anxiety, uh, with stress, and, a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a just an absence of fulfillment. And she started asking him, so what do you want to be when you grow up? And he knew exactly. He said, a VC. And she said, well, what's that? A venture capitalist. Well, what's a venture capitalist? And he described it. And he says, well, how, she says, how are you going to get there? And he says, I need to go to this school. I need to go to this high school. I need to make these grades to get into this college. I need to get this internship while I'm at college. And after college, I need to work for two years with this firm, uh, go back and get my MBA, and then I'll be set on my path. And why do you want to do this? Uh, so that I can have what everybody else in my neighborhood has. So I can have all of this stuff. Little more than elementary school, and that's his worldview. And I imagine Jesus, just like he did for the rich man, ached. So that's not what life's about. She described parents paying $150 to $200 an hour to tutor their B-plus student in subjects that weren't really their gift, so that they could accomplish these goals that we set as the mark. Jesus looks at these children. He loves these children, and he says there's a lot more to life. There's a lot more to uh, your mission and your responsibility than that. That's one of the things I'm proudest of as a school is I believe that we change that paradigm and we let children see what's really important, that they have the opportunity to build the kingdom of heaven here on earth, that God made them with special gifts, that if they utilize those gifts that they've been given, that they can make an incredible change, that they can be transformed that they've been agents of God's goodness. One of uh, the great writers of uh, the 20th and 21st century, William, William on uh, a bishop in the Methodist church and a professor, uh, took this story uh, to the college campus that he was working and he was doing a Bible study with some students uh, and he was moved by the answers. And because I didn't want to paraphrase because I think that the answers were powerful, I, I wrote them down. So he asked the students, what do you make of this story? One of the students asks, has Jesus ever met this man before? Why do you ask? Williamson asked. Because Jesus seems to have a lot of faith in him. He demands something risky, radical of him. I wonder if Jesus knew this man had a gift for risky, radical response. In my experience, a professor only demands the best from students that the professor thinks are the smartest, best students. I wonder what there was about this man that made Jesus have so much faith that he could really be a disciple. Wow, Willimon thought. I never thought about that. And this breaks my heart. This is from another student. Another student said thoughtfully, I wish Jesus would ask something like this of me. My parents totally control my life just because they are paying all my bills. 
And I complain about them calling the shots, but I am so tied to all of this stuff that I don't think I could ever break free. But maybe Jesus thinks otherwise. God is calling all of us to ask that internal question, what part do we hold out of the water so that, so that we are not totally immersed by God's grace and God's goodness and God's call for us? What part leaves us from being transformed? Jesus looked him in the eye. Jesus looks us in the eye. And Jesus loves us. Loves us enough to ask us to let go, to be immersed, to be transformed. Amen.